any particular issues at this point or any questions remaining from the previous few lectures? Okay, then I guess we can get started with our next topic. That will be the topic of constrained optimization. So constrained optimization is continuing from our previous lecture where we looked at unconstrained optimization. And I think to illustrate what the difference is, it helps to have a, a little example. So I want to show you an example where we might get a constrained optimization problem in biology. So let's suppose that we're interested in figuring out how quickly we can synthesize a molecule through a set of reactions. So let's suppose that there is a molecule A and a molecule B. And these produce some molecule C through a reaction A plus 2B goes to C. And then we'll suppose further that C and B combine to produce another molecule D through a reaction B plus 2C goes to D. And the question I want to ask is, if we feed a certain amount of A and B into the system, so there's some maximum rate at which we can introduce those, then what is the maximum rate at which D can come out of the system? So that's the question we're going to try to solve, and I'll go through how we can pose that as an optimization problem. So is the question clear to everyone? Okay. So if we want to do this, let's suppose we've got some maximum rate at which we're introducing A, and I'll say maybe this is two molecules per second, and some maximum rate at which we're introducing B, let's say three molecules per second. And then what I'm going to do is declare that we can represent each of the steps of these reactions by some variable representing the flux of molecules through a particular step of this chain of reactions. So we can declare that x1 represents the flux of A into the system, which I've just told you is limited to two molecules per second. And we'll declare that there's some x2 that represents the flux of B into the system. That's at most three molecules per second. So is that clear to everyone? OK, we can do the same thing then with the other edges. We can say that some fraction of the A here is being fed into the reaction that produces C. We'll call that x3 and some fraction of the B that we can call X4 is being fed into the reaction that produces C. Another part of the amount of B we have coming into the system is going to this other reaction, and likewise of C is going to that reaction. We'll refer to these as X5 and X6. And then finally, we'll declare that the amount of D that comes out of the reaction is X7. So that gives us a set of variables that describe what's going on inside this reaction system. And then what we want to do is, in terms of these variables, formally state what we're trying to solve here. So I told you that our objective is to figure out the maximum amount of D that's coming out of the system. And we've already said that that is X7. So that is going to be our objective function. But we can't just maximize x7, we have to maximize it in a way that makes sense in terms of how we pose this problem. So one of the things we can observe, which we were given right from the beginning, is that x1 is less than or equal to 2. So that is something I gave you as an assumption about the problem. And similarly, x2 is less than or equal to 3. So those are constraints on our allowable solutions. We have to uh, come up with a solution or an assignment to all of the variables that obeys those constraints. Now things get trickier when we start getting to the other variables. So we can observe that if we have this reaction A plus 2B goes to C, that that's putting a constraint on the relative values of X3, X4, and X5. So what can we say about x3 and x5 for this reaction to be true. Well, if every molecule of C has to be produced by consuming a molecule of A, it must be the case that x5 can't be larger than x3. 
the amount of x3 we're feeding in is an upper limit on the amount of x5. So that implies another constraint here that x3 is greater than or equal to x5. We can similarly say that if two molecules have to be consumed through this reaction, the x4 one, for every x5, then that is implying that x4 is at least twice x5. Uh, yeah? Could you also go the other way and say that um, x3 has to equal x5 or has some constant? Uh, we could declare it that way. I, I guess I'm posing it in terms of greater than or equal to is to say that maybe it's leaking off somewhere, but you, you could come up with a model where you say x3 has to be exactly x5, x4 has to be exactly twice x5. Any other questions? Okay, so we can do the same thing with respect to x5, x6, and x7. So what would be the constraint sign x5 and x7? x7 is less than or equal to x5. Yeah, x7 less than or equal to x5. And what can we say about x6 versus x7? Wouldn't it be x7 is less than or equal to 2x5? Well, or, yeah, you're right. x7 yeah. is less than or equal to 2x5. And that means we're consuming two molecules of C going into here. And so x6 would be less than or equal to x7. Yeah, x6 less than or equal to, or x7 less than or equal to x6, because we're consuming one molecule through here for every molecule that comes out of here. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. For the first one, wouldn't you want x5 to be greater than or equal to 2x7, like we did before, instead of 2x5? Uh, yeah, you're right. That should be 2x7. Okay, so now it's 2x7 less than or equal, or less than or equal to x5. So at this point, we've got a set of constraints expressing exactly what has to be true for all of these variables to make sense. And then we have now a well-posed problem. In particular, this is an example of an important class of problems called linear programs. And what I want to do for most of today is to talk about how we solve problems from this class and then we'll see towards the end how to generalize that to some broader classes of problems we might be interested in solving. So this, as I say, is a particular instance of this general class of problems. And the general class of problems is defined by three elements. So we have a set of variables. So we would have some x1, x2, up through xn. And we'll often abbreviate that as a vector x, where this vector is simply the vector of all of our variables. We have a set of linear constraints. And what it means for them to be linear is that they are linear inequalities, or they could be equalities, but linear uh, equations or inequalities in terms of the variables available to us. And we can canonically write these in the form sum j equals 1 to n, aij xj less than or equal to bi, where the a's and the b's are scalar constants and the x's are our variables. So for example, we can take an equation like, well, let's say uh, x7 less than or equal to x6. That would be equivalent to saying that 0x1 plus 0x2 plus 0x3 up through 0x5 plus minus 1x6 plus 1x7 less than or equal to 0. So all of these inequalities can be put in this format. So we would often write these canonically as less than or equal to's. They could be greater than or equal to, but then just flip the signs and they become less than or equal to. And they could be equalities, but you can also express an equality as a pair of less than or equal to. So so A is less than or equal to B, and A is greater than or equal to B, which is the same as minus A is less than or equal to minus B. So basically, we can refer to them 
as less than or equal, and we often would simplify the whole program by saying that these are encoded as a matrix inequality, AX is less than or equal to B. The finest, final thing we need is a linear objective function. And that would be minimize or maximize sum i equals 1 to n of ci xi, where the c's are constants here. And that we would often abbreviate as min or max c transpose x, where c is now a vector of the coefficients. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so that then is the general form of a linear program, and a lot of problems of interest to us can be coded in this form. So many of the kinds of optimizations we've seen before, you can actually convert into linear programs. Usually if there's a special purpose algorithm, that will be faster. But lots of variants on these are things you might be able to express as linear programs, and so this is a really general tool that's worth knowing about. Now you might remember that I mentioned back a, a few weeks ago what I called integer linear programs. And an integer linear program is the same thing except that the variables are fixed to be integers, so discrete values rather than continuous real values, which is what we're assuming in this case. So an integer linear program in general is an NP-hard problem. It's hard to solve these. A real value linear program is a tractable problem or efficient algorithms to solve them. So these are a really useful thing to be able to express your problem as any problem you can put in this form can more or less efficiently solve. Any questions about that? Okay, so how we solve them is another matter because it's not quite trivial to understand. Is that a great question? I was just wondering, to solve an integer uh, linear program, couldn't you solve the real case and then do some rounding? That, that's often a heuristic for solving them. So if you solve the real uh, case, of, so the real value program, it's known as the, the relaxation of the integer one, you are likely to get a good approximation to the value. And if you're minimizing, you would get a lower bound on the, uh, or, yeah, lower bound on the solution of the integer one, but there's no guarantee that the optimal solution will be what you get by rounding to integer values. Sometimes it works out, but often that is used, these real valued ones are used as a routine within branch and bound routines to solve the integer ones. That basically, you solve part of the integer variables, then use the real valued one to get a bound on the solution of the the best possible solution for the remaining ones, and then that gives you a bound you can use to get an efficient branch and bound method. And it's one of the reasons why people often use integer linear programs, that they're, they're very easy ways to get an, a kind of automatic bound on the solution in a branch and bound method. Right, any other questions? Okay. So to understand how we solve them, I need to go through a bit of terminology and some basic concepts and how these work. And to do that, it will help to forget about this somewhat harder problem and move to a, a, an easier linear program that makes it uh, simpler to show what I'm going to be talking about. And I'll show you the following linear program. Let's say that we are trying to maximize x1 plus x2. So we're going to assume that we have two variables. And we're going to do this subject to the following constraints. We'll say that both of these are restricted to be non-negative, so x1 greater than or equal to 0, x2 greater than or equal to 0. And we'll also declare x1 plus 2x2 is less than or equal to 8, and x1 minus x2 less than or equal to 2. So that will be our linear program. And I converted it to two variables because a lot of what we want to go through to understand how you solve these has to do with interpreting it graphically or geometrically, what it means to solve an integer or a linear program. So let's put up a number axis here. And I'll just put some numbers down. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4. And we can 
think about how we would solve this by interpreting this program in terms of what these constraints mean graphically on this xy plane here, or x1, x2 plane, I guess. So the first constraint, x1 is greater than or equal to zero, is equivalent to asserting that we're looking for solutions in the right half of the, uh, this plane. And the second one, x2 is greater than or equal to zero, is an assertion that we're looking for solutions in the top half of the plane. So in each case, this is defining some axis and saying that the solutions are restricted to one side of that axis. And that actually works for these other equations as well, or inequalities. So if we've got x1 plus 2x2 less than or equal to 8, we can say that this can be understood in terms of the line x1 plus x2 equals 8. And it's an assertion that solutions lie on one side of that line. We can figure out where that line is by finding its intercepts on the axes. So if x1 were 0, that puts you on the y-axis here. That means 2x2 less than or equal to 8, or x2 less than or equal to 4. So that's going to be one of our intercepts. And if x2 is 0, x1 will be 8. And so that's telling us that we'll have solutions on one side of this line here. And in particular, they're going to be solutions below that line. We can do the same thing with this other constraint, x1 minus x2 less than or equal to 2. So the intercepts of that are going to be 0 minus 2 and 2, 0. We draw a line through there. And this will end up being an assertion that our solutions are on this side of that line. So in the two-dimensional case, our constraints will always end up like this. There will always be an assertion that the solution is on one side or another of a line. And in higher dimensions, it would be a generalization of this. So in three dimensions, constraints will turn into planes. There will be an assertion that we're looking for solutions on one side or another of a plane. And in higher dimensions, there are what are referred to as hyperplanes. So a hyperplane is just the higher dimensional generalization of a plane. But basically, that's always what's going to happen. If you have linear constraints, you'll get some sort of flat surface, and each one asserts that solutions are on one side or another of that surface. In this case, if we put together all of those constraints, we can see that those define a kind of geometric object here, this quadrilateral, and they're an assertion that all of our solutions are inside this quadrilateral. These quadrilaterals in the general case are referred to as simplices, or single one is a simplex. So the solutions will always be inside a simplex if there is any solution to the problem. And we refer to the space inside the simplex as the feasible space. So if the problem is solvable, there must be some feasible space, and we're trying to optimize the solution within that. And then points outside the feasible space are called infeasible. Okay, so I guess I should also point out, you'll sometimes see the term polytope, that you can just use synonymously with simplex, about the same kind of geometric object. So essentially what we're trying to do is optimize the objective function within the simplex or polytope that you know, defines the feasible space. Now there's no guarantee there is a feasible space. For some kinds of problems, a feasible space could be a, the empty space. You could also have an open feasible space that could be, could be possible to just move infinitely far away and keep getting better and better values. But where the problem gets interesting is where there's a finite feasible space. And so, are there any questions yet about any of this? Okay, so one other important thing we can observe, we can get to by thinking about what this objective is telling us. In particular, thinking about that objective function graphically. So just as our constraints are defined by these lines in two dimensions, or planes in three dimensions, and so forth, we can also think of our objective function being defined in terms of a line, or a plane, or a hyperplane. In particular, think of it in terms of a family of lines that correspond to constant values of the objective function. So, for example, 
if we wanted to know where the objective function was zero, we know it would be zero at the point zero, zero. And it would, in fact, be zero in a line running uh, along x1 equals minus x2, which is this line. We have a zero value for the objective function. And the objective function would increase as we move this line, basically shift it uh, perpendicular to the direction the line is going. So if we draw a perpendicular to that line, if you slide that line along that perpendicular in this direction, the objective gets lower. So if we move down by one, we would have a line corresponding to solutions with objective value minus one. If we move it up, we have objective value plus one, and so forth. And one of the things we can observe here is if we just keep sliding it, there will eventually be some last point it touches in the simplex before it slides out of the feasible region. And that point is going to be the optimal value for our problem. In this case, it comes out to the point 4, 2. And that's always going to be true in a linear programming problem. You are always going to have some final point at which the value is optimal. It's always going to be a vertex of the simplex. Now, it is possible if these lines of constant objective value happen to be parallel to one of the lines that defines an edge of the simplex, it's possible that you actually hit an entire edge and then everywhere on there would be optimal but you're always at least guaranteed that there is an optimal solution at a vertex in every linear program, as long as there's some feasible region. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so that observation is the basis of the first technique that was proposed for solving these, and a technique I want to go through for how we can solve them. Um, yeah. What if the uh, feasible region is infinite? Yeah, so, so if, if it's infinite, it's possible there is no finite solution. So it, you could have a feasible region that maybe looks like a cone, and then depending on what your objective function is, either this would be the optimum, or it could just go off to infinity. So those are both possibilities. But if, if there is a finite optimum, it has to be at a vertex. Any other questions? Okay, so this observation that it has to be at a vertex is one of the key factors behind a method called the simplex method. And the simplex method uses this fact that optima have to be in vertices, as well as the fact that if we have a linear objective function, you can, in a sense, always improve that objective function through local movements until you get to this optimum point. So in other words, if we're anywhere other than the optimum, you just have to move in the direction of this tangent line, and you will get closer to an optimum. And those two observations together led to the idea that we can come up with a greedy algorithm. So an algorithm where you can start at any arbitrary vertex and keep taking locally good steps, and you're guaranteed to eventually get to an optimal solution. The basic idea behind it is that we can pick some starting point, let's say 0, 0, that is a vertex of the simplex, and then all we need to do is see, is there at least one vertex neighboring to that one that has a better objective value? If there is, we can take that one. In this case, we could go either right or up. Both of those improve the objective, and it doesn't matter in terms of eventually getting to an optimum. Let's say we go up to point zero four. And then we can look again and ask, is there a neighbor of that vertex that has a better objective value? And we can observe that this one improves the objective from 4 to 6. So we can take that move and end up here. And then we can ask again, is there a neighbor of that point that would improve the objective value? There are two neighbors. This one has objective 2. This one has objective 4. So there isn't. And that is enough to guarantee that we found the optimal solution. No neighbor has a better objective value, and we know we're at the globally optimal solution. So that basically is the simplex method, although in implementing it, things get more complicated. But that's the intuition, at least. Does that make sense to everyone? OK. So what I want to do is go through how we would actually do this for harder problems, ones where we can't just draw the simplex. And it's not entirely trivial, because these simplices can get very complicated. 
if you have n variables, the number of vertices can actually be exponential in n. So the, you, you can't just count the vertices or go through all of them. You need to do it somewhat more intelligently. But we'll go through a way that we can do that by hand and see how it really works. And then I'll tell you a bit about some more complicated methods you wouldn't want to run by hand. So to get to the simplex method, it helps to start by putting a problem into a particular format called the standard form, which will just make it easier to handle the math for these simplex uh, problems. And the standard form is the following. We will take our linear program, we'll express it specifically as minimizing rather than maximizing. So we're minimizing some C transpose X. And we will express all of our constraints in a particular format. So we'll have some set of constraints, A11, X1, plus A12, X2, etc., up through A1N, Xn, equals B1. So this is an equality constraint, not an inequality. And then we'll have a set of those. So up through some, let's say, AM1X1 plus AM2X2, etc., up through A. Mn, Xn equals Bm. So all of these are equality constraints. And the only inequality constraints we'll have will be of the following form. X1 greater than or equal to 0, X2 greater than or equal to 0, and the same for all of our variables. So we insist that there is an inequality constraint forcing each of our variables to be specifically greater than or equal to 0. All of our other constraints are equality constraints. And that, collectively, is what we mean by standard form. So is the definition clear to everyone? Okay. So if we want our program in standard form, then we'll need a way of taking our program in whatever form we're originally given it and turning it into the standard form version we want. And I'll just abbreviate that the standard form version we would typically refer to as minimize C transpose x subject to ax equals b x greater than or equal to 0. So that's just a shorthand for what we've said here. Okay, so if we want to take a program that is not in standard form and put it in standard form, that's not so hard to do, but there are a few basic steps we need to to, to use that. And the first of the steps is that we're going to try to get rid of all of our greater than or equal to constraints except for ones that are of this form, x greater than or equal to zero. So, and we can do that as follows. We can say if we've got any aj transpose x greater than or equal to ej, so we've got some constraint that is a greater than or equal to, we'll just turn it into the following minus aj transpose x is less than or equal to minus dj. So just multiply both sides by negative 1. That lets you flip the inequality. So if we do that to all of our greater than or equal to's, then we have no greater than or equal to constraints. All right, so is that clear to our friends? OK, so the next thing we want to do is a little trickier to get. And this is to take now our less than or equal to constraints and turn those into equality constraints. And the way we do that is as follows. If we have some aj transpose x less than or equal to bj, then what we're going to do is turn that into the following. aj transpose x plus, let's call this xj bar equals bj, and then throw in a second constraint, xj bar greater than or equal to 0. So what this is asserting is that if the thing on the left is smaller than the thing on the right, then it must be smaller than the thing on the right by some non-negative amount. And that non-negative amount is this thing encoded as xj bar, which is referred to as a slack variable. So essentially what we're doing is we're saying that xj bar is the amount by which aj transpose xj, uh, x is less than bj. And then we can assert that since this was a less than or equal to, xj bar has to be non-negative. 
if these were exactly equal, x j bar would be exactly zero. So what we've done then is get rid of our less than or equal to constraints. So we've got equality constraints and just inequalities of this form, asserting all our variables are greater than or equal to zero. So is everyone with me so far? Okay. The next thing we do, which we would only do if we have some x that might be negative. So if xi might be negative. So essentially, if we don't already have a constraint asserting that xi is non-negative, then what we're going to do is transform the variable xi into a combination of two variables, xi plus minus xi minus, where we then assert xi plus greater than or equal to zero, xi minus greater than or equal to zero. So this is just a way of taking variables that might be negative and allowing us to throw in greater than or equal to constraints for every variable. If xi were negative, then we would say xi plus is zero, xi minus is positive. If xi is positive, we say xi minus is zero, xi plus is positive. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, and then the last thing we need to do is if we happen to have maximization, so maximizing C transpose X, then we just say that we are instead going to minimize minus C transpose X. So we just change C to minus C, and then we've got a minimization problem. Did you do a quick, quick example of number three of the X I minus? Uh, yeah, well, well, if we... Well, let's say we were looking at this problem and we didn't have the constraint x1 was greater than or equal to zero. What we could do is just say, everywhere we have an x1, we would plug in this x1 plus and x1, or x1 plus minus x1 minus. So we would change our objective function to maximizing x1 plus minus x1 minus plus x2. We change this to x1 plus minus x1 minus plus 2x2 less than or equal to 8 and, and so forth. Is, is that clear? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, so that basically gives us a way of getting our program into the standard form. And then what we're going to want to do is perform the actual simplex algorithm on the program. Now, one of the things that I think is important for understanding how the simplex algorithm works is that this is, going, is implicitly assuming some particular things about this matrix A that are kind of important to understanding how the algorithm works. In particular, we are assuming matrix A is underdetermined. So if we've got m constraints and n variables, we are basically assuming m less than n. So what would go wrong if m were equal to n? So if A were a full rank system. Well, if A were a full rank, then there would be a unique solution to Ax equals b. So the feasible region for that part of the constraints would be exactly one point. And either that would satisfy the, these other constraints or it wouldn't. If it didn't, then there's no solution. If it did, then there's just that one solution. So basically, if A were full rank, then it, this is just a linear system solving problem. What would go wrong if A were an overdetermined system? Yeah, so if it's overdetermined, then there's no uh, value of x that's going to satisfy all of the constraints, which is another way of saying that the feasible region is empty, so there's no solution to the problem. So it's only really meaningful when A is an underdetermined system. And the reason we put this into this standard form is it makes it relatively simple to think about what it means to be at a vertex of the simplex. So essentially what we need to do to come up to a, with a solution to the problem is we need to have all of these inequalities satisfied and we need to have all of the equalities satisfied. So if we have n variables, 
and m of those are satisfied by a, then that means we need n minus m additional constraints that we have to throw in to uniquely specify the solution. And the way we throw those in is by saying that n minus m of these x's are exactly zero. So the reason we put this in this form where all of our inequality constraints are exactly zero is because we know that's when it's hitting the edges of the simplex. When a variable goes to zero, that means it's hit one of these constraints at the edge of the simplex. And when n minus m of them go to zero, that means we've forced it to a vertex of the simplex. So we've got it down to a single point where the system is now uniquely determined and there's a unique solution to all of the other variables. So everyone followed that? Okay, so the simplex method is basically a way of taking advantage of that observation to give us a way of solving the problem in practice. So the way we're going to go through this is that we are first going to pick an initial vertex. So to start the simplex method, you have to be at a vertex. You have to find a vertex of the polytope. It doesn't really matter which one, and it could affect the efficiency, but basically you have to find one. That's not necessarily a trivial thing to do, because not every way of forcing n minus n with these to zero is going to give you a solution to the problem. But usually you can kind of design the problem so that there is an obvious solution, or at least pick one based on the structure of the problem. So basically, you kind of try to design your model so that it's easy to get a good starting point. So I'll just assume we have that. And if you do, then you can rewrite your problem in terms of the variables that are zero. I'll just call those the zero variables. We have to force n minus m of the variables to zero, so what we'll try to do is rewrite everything so that, those are, so that the other variables and our objective are expressed in terms of the ones we force to zero. We then find some variable xi that has a negative coefficient in the objective function. And what that means is that xi is at zero, and increasing xi lowers the objective function. We're trying to minimize here, so that's telling us that xi is one of the thing, one of the constraints we're hitting. We're hitting the xi greater than or equal to zero constraint, and by moving away from that constraint, we improve the objective function. So what's going to happen is that we can pick that one, and we know that we can move along one edge of the simplex to improve the objective, and then what we'll do is increase xi until some other xj becomes zero. So one of the xj's that wasn't already zero becomes zero, and that corresponds to now hitting another objective. So basically what we've, or excuse me, hitting another constraint. So what this means is that we've picked a vertex where xi is zero, and this increase of xi means that we slide along an edge of the simplex <coughs> until we hit another vertex where now xi is non-zero and xj is zero. So that is the basic simplex operation. And then basically what we do is just go back to step two, and we keep repeating that until this fails, and the way it will fail is that eventually step three won't work. We won't be able to find an xi that is negative in objective, and that would mean that we're at a global optimum. So that at a high level is how it works, and I think it, it'll be easiest to understand if I just start with an example and we walk through what these steps look like. So let's suppose we've got the following problem. We are maximizing x1 plus 3x2 given the following. x1 minus x2 greater than or equal to minus 4 x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 10, x1 greater than or equal to 0, x2 greater than or equal to 0. So we're assuming that this is our program, and we'll see how we can solve this. So the first thing we need to do is put this in standard form. And I'm not going to walk through all of the steps individually, but we can go through and see how each of those would apply. We have a maximization objective, so we need to convert that to minimization. 
So what would this become in the minimization form? Okay, we're minimizing minus x1 minus 3x2. So if maxim, if to convert maximization to minimization, to split the sign. And we then need to rewrite some of our constraints to get all of this in standard form. But we do need to modify these constraints here. So we have the constraint x1 minus x2 greater than or equal to minus 4. So we're in this condition here. We've got a greater than or equal to, so we need to flip it to a less than or equal to. So we'll say that we will just flip the sums on that. Minus x1 plus x2 less than or equal to plus 4. And we will then end up in this condition that we've got a less than or equal to, so we'll need to throw in a slack variable. And if we just combine those together, what we'll end up with is minus x1 plus x2, we'll call the slack variable x3 equal to 4. So that's what we get if we apply those two steps to this constraint. So what would we get from this constraint? How would we modify that? Yeah, so we will take x1 plus x2, we'll throw in a slack variable we can call x4, say that equals 10, and then we just have to remember to throw in greater than or equal to constraints for our slack variables as well. <coughs> and that gives us our standard form linear program. Now if we want to apply the simplex method, then what we're going to need to do is find a starting point. And I've defined this in such a way that we can pick a, a relatively trivial starting point, so x1 equals x2 equals 0. So we have a system with two equality constraints and four variables, so we know that we're going to have to fix two more variables to get it down to a unique solution. So we're choosing to fix x1 and x2, basically make them hit these two constraints. And then that will uniquely determine x3 and x4, since we now have a full rank set of constraints. All right, so the way we're going to evaluate that, at least in the, when we do this by hand, is as follows. So we're going to take our constraints and rewrite them so that we're expressing the variables that aren't zero in terms of the ones that are zero. So for the moment, we're going to leave our uh, objective function alone. That's going to be minimum minus x1 minus 3x2. But we're going to rewrite the first constraint so that it expresses x3 in terms of x1 and x2. So that will become x3 equals x1 minus x2 plus 4. So that's just rewriting this thing to express x3 in terms of x1 and x2. And we'll do the same with the other constraint to get x4 equals minus x1 minus x2 plus 10. And that actually immediately tells us what x3 and x4 are at this point. Since x1 and x2 are 0, we know x3 equals 4, x4 equals 10. So that is our point in the four-dimensional space, including our slack variables, and that's where we're going to start from. All right, so the next thing we need to do then is we've got our starting vertex. We need to find a variable we can increase to improve on that. So we have to look at the objective function, and we observe that both of the variables in the objective function have negative coefficients. So increasing either of those will lower the value of the objective, so we can actually use either of them as our next step. And I'll just say, let's pick x2 because it's got a larger coefficient, so increases will tend to lower things more quickly. There's no guarantee that's the better one to pick, but let's just use that. And we would then need to figure out how much we can increase it before it forces one of the non-zero variables to be zero. So this first constraint is putting a limit on how much we can increase x2 before x3 becomes 0. What constraint is that putting on, and how much can we increase x2 according to this uh, equation? Four. Yeah, we can increase it up to 4 because that's the point where this becomes 4, then this minus x2 plus 4 would become 0. So basically, this says that we can't increase x2 more than 4. This one then would say that we can't increase x2 more than 10, 
So we have to pick the lesser of those. Uh, we know x2 can't be more than 4, and it can't be more than 10. So 4 would be the ultimate constraint. So what we're going to say is we will move x2 to become 4, and that we know is going to make x3 become 0. So that will be our first move, and that corresponds to a move along an edge of the simplex. And we can figure out what happens there by rewriting in terms of the variables that are now 0 basically re-expressing x2 in terms of x3 and x1. And all we need to do is rewrite this equation so that we now move x2 to the left-hand side, x3 to the right-hand side. So that is going to become the following. x2 equals x1 minus x3 plus 4. And that tells us that now since x1 and x3 are 0, x2 is 4. We also need to figure out how changing x2 affected this equation, and we would do that by plugging this thing in for x2 in this equation. Effectively, we want to get x2 out of the right-hand sides of our constraints and put x3 into them. So we take our prior constraint, x4 is minus x1 minus x2 plus 10, and just plug in that thing, x1 minus x3 plus 4 for x2 here. And if we evaluate that, what we're going to end up with is that x4 is equal to minus 2 x1 plus x3 plus 6. So in the process of moving x2 to 4, we've also lowered x4 from 10 to 6. Are you going to follow that? We also need to do the same thing with our objective function. So we were minimizing minus x1 minus 3x2. We want to express that in terms of x1 and x3 now. So we plug in this equation, or this formula for x2, into the objective. And what we're going to end up with is that our objective, we'll now say, is minimizing minus 4x1 plus 3x3 minus 12. Since x1 and x3 are 0, that tells us that at this new point, the value of the objective is minus 12. Any questions yet? OK, so can anyone tell me what we do next? We've just moved to a new vertex of the simplex, and now we need to see if there's another vertex we can move to. So we look at our objective function and we see, is there a variable that's currently 0 that has a negative coefficient in the objective? And we can see that we have two variables in the, in the objective, x1 and x3, and only x1 has a negative coefficient. So we have to increase x1. That's the only move available to us at this point. And then we have to see how much we can increase it. We've got two constraints that tell us a limit on how much we can increase it. So either we will use this constraint, or we'll use this constraint. So if we want to increase x1, how much does this constraint limit the amount we can increase x1? Well, we want to figure out how much we can increase it before x2 goes to 0. Basically, this is telling us that there's no limit. No matter how much we increase x1, x2 isn't going to go to 0, because x1 has a positive coefficient here. So this doesn't limit how much we can increase x1. What about this constraint? How much can we increase x1 before x4 goes to 0? Yeah, so we can increase x1 to a maximum of 3, so that's going to be the next move. We will increase x1 to 3. That will move x4 into our set of 0 variables. So that corresponds, again, to sliding along an edge of the simplex to a new vertex. And again, we can rewrite. So we can try to put now x3 in terms of x, or uh, put x1 in terms of x3 and x4. So we will rewrite this equation here. We're going to get the following. 
4 is minus 2x1 plus x3 plus 6. And we rearrange that's equivalent to saying x1 is 1 half x3 minus 1 half x4 plus 3, or in other words, x1 equals 3. And we're going to need to plug in this formula for x1 into our other constraint and into our objective function. So we're going to get that our other constraint is x2 equals x1, which is this thing, 1 half x3 minus 1 half x4 plus 3 minus x3 plus 4. And if we work through the math there, what this is going to come out to is that x2 is minus 1 half x3 minus 1 half x4 plus 7. Or in other words, x2 is currently 7. And we then have to do the same with our objective function. So we want to plug in our new value for x1 into x1 here. So we're going to get that our objective is minimizing minus 4 times 1 half x3 minus 1 half x4 plus 3 plus 3x3 three minus 12. And if we simplify that, that's going to be equal to x3 plus 2x4 minus 24. Okay. So we're now at a new vertex, where now x3 and x4 are equal to 0, x2 is 7, x1 is 3. And our objective value is minus 24. So what do we do next? Well, at this point, basically, we're stuck. So the objective has only positive coefficients for the variables, which means we can't increase either of these variables and improve the objective. So that tells us that we're done. We've reached a global optimum. Or equivalently, there's no edge of the simplex from our current vertex that's going to make this value lower. So we know at this point that we've actually finished solving the problem. And the solution is at the point x1 equals 3, x2 equals 7. And our slack variables at that point are 0 and 0. And our objective function has a value of minus 24. Now we do have to remember that we originally converted this to standard form by flipping the direction of the optimization. So in our original problem, we were maximizing this function instead of minimizing the, the negative of it. So in our original problem, the value of the objective would have been plus 24. But basically, that's the optimal solution to this program. So did everyone follow that? OK, so that basically is the simplex method. As I say, I presented this in a form that I, I think makes it possible to do this by hand and really understand what is going on as we go through this. This, uh, this way of describing it comes from one of the references that's cited in the textbook. I think it's a good way of going through this to understand. In practice, if we were really trying to implement this, there are ways of automating it much more effectively. In particular, all of this rewriting I'm doing is really solving a linear system. What we're trying to do every time we rewrite is take a system in which we have our equality constraints and we've got some additional constraints uh, corresponding to some of the variables being forced to zero. And we're swapping one variable out of that set, putting in another, and then solving the linear system to find the values of the non-zero variables. So basically, you can automate this by, at each step, taking one variable that is zero and one that isn't, swapping that, and then solving for all the non-zero variables just as a linear system solver. And that basically is the simplex method. So are there any questions about that? OK, uh, yeah? Um, can we extend this methodology to nonlinear functions and the exercise? Uh, this doesn't work for nonlinear functions. I will in a moment go through at a somewhat higher level a different kind of method that works for some nonlinear functions. But the simplex method, you pretty much need it to be linear for things to work. And any other questions? Okay, so there was some interesting kind of computational theory behind these methods. And 
there was a debate for a long time about whether linear programming was a tractable problem. For a long time, no one knew whether it was tractable. But the simplex method is not actually a tractable algorithm for linear programming. There are cases where the simplex method can require an exponential number of steps. In practice, it seems to work very well, but you can design cases where it's not going to work well. And so there's this debate for a long time about whether there is actually a, an efficient algorithm. And it was eventually settled through the development of a class of algorithms called interior point methods. And the basic idea behind interior point methods is, even though we know the solution has to lie at a vertex of the simplex, what we will instead do is work inside the simplex, pick a point in the interior, in the feasible region, and do a kind of optimization that involves moving within the feasible region. And it turned out that that was an approach that led to provably efficient algorithms for this problem. The original method for this I won't go into is something called the ellipsoid method that was kind of nice for the theory. It gave a way of getting a proof, but was not really a practical method. In practice, it was much too slow and complicated, and people would still use the simplex method. But what eventually did become practical was a class of methods called barrier methods. And we'll look at one version of a barrier method that's based on something called Karmarkar's method that really did become a practical way of solving these and for a while was the standard way people would solve linear programs. Today, you would sometimes use barrier methods, sometimes use simplex on any real problem. One or the other might be better and there's a lot of theory behind how we can speed up both of them. But I think it's good to be familiar with these barrier methods because these uh, actually do extend to some classes of nonlinear optimization. So the basic idea, I'm going to go through at a high level, and I'm not going to work through an example because th these are too hard to do by hand. But the basic idea is that we start with some feasible x0, so with some initial guess as to our solution. And graphically, what this would correspond to is that we have our simplex, we have some point x0 within that simplex, and it has to be a point that is not on the boundary. So even though we know we're eventually going to get to a vertex, we want this point pulled back at least a little bit from the boundary. And what we're going to try to do is to transform the coordinate system to move the point further away from the boundary. Ideally, we want it as far from the boundaries as possible. Now, if we've got our program in standard form, then there's a, a nice, convenient way of transforming your coordinates to create an equivalent problem where you know the point is far from the boundary, and that is to create a new variable, a, a new vector, let's call it x bar, which is created by taking our old vector of variables x, and then just taking a diagonal matrix whose diagonal elements are the current values of x. And inverting that and multiplying that by x. So in other words, we take the current value of each x and divide it by its current value. So we get a new variable that right now has value 1 in all of these. So x bar is always going to have the value 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Does that make sense to everyone? Right, so that guarantees that at least in this new coordinate system, we're not too close to any boundary of the simplex. And there's some basic transformations we can do to make that work, essentially saying that if x bar is x inverse times x, and that's equivalent to saying capital X x bar equals little x, and so we can do various transformations to say that minimizing xc transpose x bar is equivalent to minimizing C transpose X. And we can say that if we had the equality constraints AX equals B, we can transform those to equivalent constraints A capital X, X bar equals B. These are going to be equivalent because X, X bar is e or, uh, capital X, X bar is equal to little x. And likewise, x greater than or equal to zero, we just transform it to x bar greater than or equal to zero. We've just scaled each of these by a constant amount, so these are equivalent. So basically, 
if you get the current values of the variables, it's not too hard to create an equivalent linear program in a new coordinate system where we're guaranteed that x bar is far from any boundary because the boundaries are always where the values go to zero. Everyone follow that? Okay, so what we next want to do is something kind of like the steepest descent method we saw last time. So we want, and we want to move in, or actually minus the gradient, to optimize our objective as quickly as possible. So essentially what we want to do is move in the direction of minus the gradient of our objective function. So let's call that gradient of g. And that is going to be the direction we want to go to improve our objective function as much as possible or as quickly as possible. So if our objective function is C transpose x, what's the gradient of that? First derivative? Yeah, it's the, the vector of first derivatives. And in particular, if we write this out, we've got C1x1 plus C2x2 plus C3x3, etc. Then the partial of, of, of this with respect to x1 is C1, the partial with respect to x2 is C2, partial with respect to x3 is C3. Or in other words, the gradient is just C. So it's pretty easy to figure out for a linear program, and minus gradient is minus C. Now there's a catch here, which is that we can't quite move in the direction of the gradient. And the reason is because we have to preserve our equality constraints. So we have ax equals b that has to remain true. And if we start perturbing x, we're going to break this. So we have to do something a little more complicated to ensure that the equality constraints don't break. And what we do is to use something known as the null space of a. And the null space is a concept from linear algebra that works as follows. Suppose we have some vector v such that, let's call it v1, such that a v1 is the null zeros vector. And suppose we have another vector that's not a multiple of v1, let's call it v2, that also has that property. And another one that is not a linear combination of these that also has that property, and so forth then any linear combination of these is also going to have that property. So if a, v, 1 equals 0, and a, v, 2 equals 0, then a times you know, c, 1, v, 1, plus c, 2, v, 2, also equals 0, or any linear combination. So effectively, if you can find a set of vectors like this, they define a set of coordinates, a space where every vector in that space has the property that multiplying it by a gives you out the zero vector. And that's always going to be defined if a is underdetermined. There's going to be some null space to it. And we're going to use this concept of a null space to get around the problem that we can't afford to change ax equals b. Because if we could find any vector h in the null space, then we could say a x plus, let's say, alpha times h is going to be ax plus a alpha h, which is going to be b plus the zero vector, or just b. So essentially, if we move, rather than in the gradient, we move in the direction of anything in the null space, then we don't break our equality constraints. So we need some way of moving in a vector that is almost minus the gradient, but is in the null space. And it turns out there's a nice formula for doing that. h equals i minus a transpose a a transpose inverse a times minus the gradient. This thing will give us an h that is the gradient projected into the null space. So basically the closest we can get to the gradient in the null space. And if we then start moving along that, then we improve our objective value without breaking our equality constraints. Does that make sense to everyone? OK, so we've almost got the entire algorithm at that point. We now know that we've got a almost steepest descent direction we can move in that is going to preserve our equality constraints. 
So we just need to move in that direction. So we're just going to say that we get some xi plus 1, which becomes xi plus some alpha times this vector h that's, all, that's the projection of the gradient into the null space. In particular, we just need to pick alpha, so it takes us almost to the boundary of the simplex. So if we have our simplex here, we want to go almost but not quite to the boundary of the simplex. If you actually hit the boundary, then you're kind of stuck because then you can't move any further in the direction of the gradient. But if you almost get there, then we'll get some new x i plus 1. And we can pretty much figure out how far to go the same way we saw with the simplex method. Just try all of the constraints, see how big alpha can be before it hits each individual constraint. And the smallest of those tells us what alpha we can use. And then you just back up a little bit from that. And then you get to your new point. And then at that point, you just go back to the first step of the, the barrier method. So we go from this step four, we go back to And at that point, we are basically done with our algorithm, or at least we've got all the pieces of it. We can keep walking through this, and at some point, we're going to get close enough to a solution that we can figure out that we're uniquely at a particular vertex, and we know exactly which vertex is going to be the solution, then we can just pick that one. So essentially, just to walk through the whole thing again, we start from some initial point, we transform our coordinates to move away from the simplex, we figure out our projection of the steepest descent direction into the null space of, of our coordinate system. We move almost to the boundary. Then we go back, transform again, so we move away from the boundary and just keep doing that. And that gives us an algorithm for solving the linear programs, so a version of these interior point methods. Uh, like I said, this is not something I, I want to do by hand, so I'm not going to walk through an example, but that is basically how an interior point method works. So are there any questions about any of that? Okay, so these interior point methods, as I said, uh oh, is there a question? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to know how, how do we check alpha? Uh, well, it, it's not too important. But, you, know, you, you can just figure out the large, the smallest, well, figure out the largest alpha can be without uh, breaking any of the constraints. So where the lowest alpha that hits some constraint, and then just multiply it by something a little less than one, so 0.99 or alpha or whatever. So, so just back it up a little bit. Uh, and you could probably be a bit more precise in terms of the machine precision of your computer. You want it to be far enough back that you're not going to run into round-off errors that put you right on the boundary or over it. But, uh, it you know, I'm not sure that there's an exact rule for that. Any other questions? Okay, so that basically is the two main classes of methods we would use for linear programs. And I will say that usually if we're trying to solve a linear program, we don't actually want to implement one of these. There are great linear program solvers that are out there. So a lot of people who are really experts on these things have developed theory to make these run much faster in practice. So usually you don't really want to do one of these on your own. You want to use one of these specialized solvers. Now there is an unfortunate catch for some of us, which is that Linear programming has a lot of important applications in the business world. So if any of you take any classes in Tepper School here or other uh, uh, you know, business schools, they use linear programming quite a lot for various applications. And because of that, really good linear program solvers have traditionally been something you can sell access to for a lot of money. So a lot more than an academic researcher can pay. That's kind of changed over the years. It used to be that an academic couldn't get access to really good linear program solvers. Today, there are some really nice free ones out there, but it's just something to be aware of. You can get good solvers, but the best ones might still be something that you, you'd have to pay a considerable amount of money to, to access. All right, but that basically is linear programming in practice. 
And there's one last topic I wanted to mention today, and that is how can we generalize beyond this? So how can we go to nonlinear programming? In general, nonlinear programming is a hard thing to do. There's no method that's going to work and get a global optimum on every sort of nonlinear programming problem the way we can with linear programming problems. So you can't even globally solve every, uh, un every unconstrained nonlinear problem. But there are some important classes of problems that are still solvable by essentially the same kinds of barrier methods. So I want to tell you a bit about those. And to understand those, we need to understand a concept called convexity. So you, you can have a convex set. And a convex set S has the property that if we pick any two points x, y, and s, then any interpolant between those points, alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y, is also in s for all alpha in 0, 1. And graphically, what that would mean is if we draw the set as some region of a space, then you can't pick any two points in the set for which a line between them goes outside the set. Any two points you pick, the line between them is entirely within the set. So this would be a convex set. This would be a non-convex set, because we can pick a point here and a point here, and the line between them would go outside the set. We can also talk about convex functions. So a convex function f has the property that if we take any two points on the function and interpolate between them as follows, so if we have some f of alpha x plus 1 minus alpha y, what we're going to end up with is something that is strictly less than or equal to alpha f of x plus 1 minus alpha f of y, again for alpha in 0, 1. And what that means is that if we take, let's say, an axis and plot f in the one variable case of so f or a function of one variable, what this would mean is if we pick any two points on the function and draw a line between them, the function is strictly below that line. A more intuitive definition is that the function is upwardly curving at every point. So anywhere you go, it's you know, moving left to right, it's curving upward. And in higher dimensions, it kind of has the same intuition. So a sort of bowl-shaped thing is a convex function in higher dimensions. So this would be a convex f. And just like we can have a non-convex set, we can imagine a non-convex function. So here we could pick two points on the function, and the line between them passes below it. So this would be non-convex. And the important point in introducing these is that if you have a program in which the constraints define a convex set, and the objective is a convex function, or in particular we're trying to minimize a convex function, then that's still solvable by the interior point methods. So you can still get a globally optimal solution. Okay, so any questions about that? All right, so basically what convexity is giving you is well, convexity of the function is giving you the property that the function has a unique minimum. So if a function is convex, that says that basically there is some basin and taking local movements, so essentially steepest descent or gradient descent movements, will eventually get you to the bottom of the basin. So that's why it's important to have a convex function. And convex constraints basically mean that you can't get stuck. There's no way that following the gradient can sort of hit an edge and just get you stuck before you get to the optimum. So that's kind of the intuition for why that's important. 
And linear constraints and linear objective function is a special case of this. It's pretty common to work with uh, convex but nonlinear functions. It, you don't see so much people working with convex constraint sets, but the theory at least works there. It's just messier to work with convex but nonlinear constraints, but you can do that. Now, there is kind of a catch in higher dimensions, which is that it's not necessarily trivial to figure out that you're working with a convex function. So there is a technical condition that tells us that a function is convex, and that is that the Hessian is positive semi-definite. So does anyone remember what a Hessian is? Think yeah, so the matrix of all of the second derivatives. So if we take the matrix of the second derivatives, then that has to be positive semi-definite. So you may remember I mentioned the term positive definite in the context of solving linear systems. Positive semi-definite is basically just a simple extension of that. It means, well, there are various definitions, but one of them is that for any uh, real vector x, we have x transpose ax greater than or equal to zero. So positive definite would just be greater than zero for non-zero x. Positive semi-definite means greater than or equal to zero. Another equivalent definition is eigenvalues of the matrix A are real and positive. So for any real valued matrix, if all the eigenvalues are real positive numbers, that also tells you that you have a positive definite matrix. It's not necessarily easy if you are looking at a, an objective function that is itself nonlinear to figure out that these properties are true at every point in the space you're looking at. They have to be true for any value of your variables for it to be true that, that you have a convex function. But there are some special cases where we can prove that without too much trouble. And one of them is what is called quadratic programming. So quadratic programming is basically the same thing as linear programming, except that instead of having just the objective minimize C transpose X, we have the objective minimize C transpose X plus x transpose bx, where b is now a positive definite matrix. So it's not too hard to verify a single matrix is positive definite. So if your objective function is of this form, you still have a convex program and you can still solve it efficiently. One place that often comes up is if you are minimizing something of the form ax transpose ax or equivalent for an even simpler version, x transpose x, so basically a least squares kind of minimization. In either of these cases, what you end up with is that this is equivalent to x transpose a transpose a x, and a transpose a is always going to be a positive definite matrix, because for any x, x transpose a transpose a x is equal to a x transpose a x, which is the dot product of a vector with itself. So it has to be greater than or equal to zero. So basically, if you can express your objective function in a form like this for positive definite B, or in a form like this for any A, you still have a solvable problem. So any questions about that? OK, so these are methods that I, you don't see as commonly as some of the other sorts of algorithmic techniques we've seen in this class. But they, they come up fairly often, so these sorts of semi-definite programming things. I, I think it's a very useful skill to know that these exist and to be able to recognize, or at least know how you might prove that you're dealing with a convex program, because it just greatly increases the class of problems you can solve and shows you that there's some problems that are maybe not so obviously solvable or we actually do have efficient methods to solve them. All right, so I think we're about out of time for the day. Are there any remaining questions before we break? Yes. 
Okay, I do want to hand out your homework twos. Uh, if anyone hasn't given me a written part of your homework one, and that isn't on Blackboard, uh, you can just leave this here, and I guess I can kind of see it around. And I uh, guess uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. Oh, one uh, note I did want to make. Uh, so starting next week when we get into simulation, there's a little background on probability that we need, so some basic terminology. I used to teach a lecture on probability, but usually ended up that what we covered was simple enough that almost everyone had encountered it before. So what I'm doing instead is I've got the notes from that particular lecture on Blackboard, and that's enough, but that should be enough for everyone.